morning, church. Good to see everybody. Let's have a word of prayer when we start. Father, we just want to thank you, Lord, for just giving us an opportunity to gather, gather together in your name. We want to bless you, Lord. So I ask, Lord, that you will take every distraction in our hearts and mind, Lord, and just clear our hearts, clear our minds, that we might worship you in spirit and truth, Lord, this morning, for you are so worthy of it, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives and changing us and making us stronger, Lord, and making us more faithful to you, Lord. And Father, again, we want you to have a hand, your hand, in our lives, Lord, and you'll continue to change us and mold us to your image. In Jesus' name.
7 p.m. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> On Wednesday night, we have our study in the book of Genesis. Remember, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was void and without form. And there was darkness upon the deep. And then what happened? The Holy Spirit moved upon the face of the water. And guess what? Things changed. Light came. You know what? For every one of you, as the word goes forth this morning, let the word penetrate your heart by the Holy Spirit to do what he desires to do. Men, join us. 845 coming this coming Saturday for the men's fellowship. We're just having a great time fellowshipping together, feeding together, and of course, uh, getting to know one another. Uh, third of all, we'd like to give, if you would like to give, there's an offering box at the back that you can give to, and you might think, oh, I don't have that much money. That's okay. The lady that Jesus watched, the one time where he talked about giving like that, he said, man, she gave more than all of them. So see, no matter what you give, you God <coughs> looking at your heart, not your money. Not like the political scene, huh? <laughs> if you're new this morning, uh, we just want to welcome you. If you'd like to have some prayer, there's a box at the back that you can uh, you know, fill out the little form there, and then we'll pray for you if you need prayer needs, and we'll also try to get together with you if we can and just pray with you that way as well. If you'd like more information about the church, please remember to visit our website at Living Truth Prescott. Uh, you can do that. Ladies, remember Friday morning group will be meeting tomorrow at 10 a.m. I got to say, ladies, the, again, the Holy Spirit wants to move on every one of you that are coming to this study. You know what? There's a lady named Dorcas in the Bible, also called Tabitha. And you know what? She died, and they thought so much of her at the church, they said when Peter came around, they asked Peter, raise her from the dead, man. And all she did is she made robes and clothing for the people of the church. What is it God's going to call you to this morning? Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful, God, for you. We want to say we couldn't do it without you. We couldn't have done these last months without you, Lord. We're so thankful that, God, all of us that are here, for some of us that have the COVID-19, Lord, you healed us. You touched us. You spent time talking to us, and that's what we want this morning, Lord. We want to hear from you. We pray that your anointing would rest upon our pastor, Chris. And Lord, that as the word goes forth, that we go forth with power to destroy the work of the enemy in our lives, Lord. And we just give you thanks for who you are. We love you, Jesus. And everyone said? Amen. 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 Thank you, Pastor Bill. Well, thank you, worship team. Wasn't that an awesome time yeah. of worship this morning? Ah, oh, man. Well, welcome, everybody. Good to see you. Hey, why don't you take, not 15 minutes, but maybe 60 seconds, stand up, and I'm, I'm so happy to be able to do this. I think there may be someone around you that you haven't met yet, so say hi to them. Any different? so great to see so many of you on Facebook again this morning. We're glad that you're with us. You're, you're here visiting us who live in God's country. Amen. Amen. As we woke up this morning and we see our beautiful blue sky with all this beautiful white stuff around us that we don't have to shovel anymore today. Well, hopefully you didn't have to today. It's just uh, beautiful here. And we're just so glad you're with us this morning. 
So if you have your Bible, open up to Revelation chapter 14. If you need a Bible, there's some right back here in the back. While you're doing that, let me just say to our Facebook family, we are aware that some people um, are having a hard time hearing that the, the volume is low. Uh, we have ordered a device that was supposed to come Friday, but now it's coming Monday. And so hopefully by next week, we're going to have that problem solved that uh, you won't have to turn your device all the way up to hear us. All right, so Revelation chapter 14. Let's just have a word of prayer before we get into it. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again that we were able to come here this morning, and Lord, right now that we spend time in your word. And I just pray, God, that you will teach us by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you will help us to see the things that we need to see, the things that are going to affect us in our life, but also, Lord, just to give us that anticipation of what is coming. And so we just thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So chapter 14 of Revelation, as I've mentioned before, we have flashbacks and flash forwards, um, kind of like when you're watching a movie. And what we're going to see now is another flash forward type scene that's anticipating what we're going to be reading about in, in a few chapters here in Revelation. It'll be that time when Jesus is going to actually return to earth, not meet us in the air, but is going to actually come down to earth and he will be reconciling all things. And I think that this chapter 14 um, forward scene here is really to bring, it was probably to bring John some encouragement. It's probably to bring us some encouragement and all those who are reading the book of Revelation. Because if we think back to what we read last week in chapter 13, it wasn't too fun. And it almost looked as though the beast was going to actually prevail. And I think this chapter, just the flow of it, was to let us know, no, that's not what's going to happen as we're previewing what is going to be spoken about in detail later. So Revelation 14, 1. Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his father, written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. That's probably where, you know, we, we get the fantasies of angels up there playing their harps. Verse 3, And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. So in this section, the main focus here is the 144,000. We've spoken about them before in the book of Revelation. These are Jews that have been sealed by God. They're protected throughout the tribulation period. And this is to show us that they are going to survive. They will be alive at the end of the tribulation. And John sees them here standing on Mount Zion. Now, you probably hear this term a lot, but do you really know what it is? Mount Zion is the name actually not just for one mountain, but it's, it's several hills that, that are in Jerusalem. And so it was used a lot in the Old Testament to really speak of the area of Jerusalem. Now there's several Old Testament prophecies about Mount Zion. I'm going to read a few of them to you. You might want to mark them down look at them later. The first is in Isaiah 24, 23. It says, then the moon, and this is speaking about the end times, then the moon will be abashed and the sun ashamed. Isn't that a funny way to put it as we've seen earlier what happens with the sun and the moon and the stars? For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, and his glory will be before his elders. Then Joel 2.32, and it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there will be those who escape 
Is this all sounding familiar to what we're reading? As the Lord has said, even among the survivors whom the Lord calls. Now, there's one very comprehensive prophecy about Mount Zion, and I want you to turn there. It's back in your Old Testament in the section of the prophets, and it's in Micah. So turn back to Micah chapter 4. And I want you to follow along with me on this because it's so important. Micah chapter 4, starting in verse 1. It says, and it will come about in the last days. Now, I, I love this because is this, is this nebulous to you or is this very clear? In the last days that the mountain of the house of the Lord will be established as the chief of the mountains. It will be raised above the hills and the peoples will stream to it. Many nations will come and say, come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob. And pay attention to this, that he may teach us about his ways. Do you remember how often when we were studying the book of Mark, we talked about every place Jesus went, what did he do? He taught about the kingdom of God. And that we may walk in his paths. For from Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Verse 3, And he will judge between many peoples and render decisions for mighty distant nations. Then they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they train for war. Boy, do we look forward to that time or what? Verse 4, each of them will sit under his vine. Underline that. Each of them will sit under his vine and under his fig tree with no one to make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts is spoken. Though all the peoples walk, each in the name of his God, as for us, we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. The amount of detail in this prophecy of Micah that we are going to see fulfilled throughout what we read in the book of Revelation. If we've spoken about more than once in the Bible, you can be pretty well guaranteed it's going to happen exactly that way. Now, these 144,000 Jews that are going to be there on Mount Zion, these are the believing Jews who have been faithful and they, as you look in here, you see that they're singly focused on one thing. This period of the tribulation, they have their minds on one thing and one thing only, and that is serving Jesus. You see that uh, the text tells us that they, they didn't marry and they did not have relations outside of the marriage. That's what it's speaking of when it says they didn't defile themselves. It's not saying you defile yourself in marriage. But it's giving you the idea that they are so singly focused that they didn't even marry. And of course they did not mess around <laughs> even though they weren't married. That's what it's speaking of here. They had one single focus. Remember, you know, Paul mentions this in the New Testament. And he talks about the gift of being single and how you can be more focused on the Lord. That we are divided somewhat when we're married. That's not a bad thing. It's just the way it is. Not with this 144,000. Their testimony, as we're learning here, to the whole world has been true and it's been accurate. And when we think of that, that's quite different from what we have read about Israel in the past, isn't it? And so it says that they get a new song and only they can learn this new song. You're like, you know, what does it have that tough of chords in it or what? We, we, we can't, you know. Uh, no, it's because their experience with God is unique. Now, it, it doesn't mean that, you know, they're more spiritual or anything else. But their experience is unique. Think about what they are going to live through during this period of the tribulation as they come to the Lord. And that they're singly focused on serving Jesus. And, of course, we believe their main focus is to evangelize the world. 
So their song is different than our song. You know how some of the songs we sing about things that are our experience, don't we? And, and that's good, because this is our experience with the Lord. Their experience, even though, you know, it, they have the Holy Spirit, not maybe the same way we do, even all of those things are the same, but their experience of what takes place in their life is going to be different than what we experience. And so it's their song, and their song alone. And I think that's pretty neat. Verse 6, And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven, having an eternal gospel to preach, to those who live on the earth, and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens and the earth and the sea and springs of waters. So we don't know exactly what this looks like, this message that's going to be preached by an angel. Um, you know, I know there was a TV station at one point in time that wanted to preach the gospel to the world. You know what they named themselves? Angel One Network. Maybe some of you have heard of that. And they were saying, well, maybe we're the angel. You know, I don't think so. But, you know, um, who knows if this isn't how it's going to happen. We, we don't know exactly uh, how that's going to happen. But we do know it is going to happen. And this gospel message at this time emphasizes the fact that God's judgment is coming. I mean, it's already come uh, in the past chapters that we've read about, but it's not done yet. His final judgment is coming. So you say, you know, well, does the gospel change? No. What kind of gospel was it called? An eternal gospel. So the gospel doesn't change ever. But the emphasis on the gospel as you're preaching it and teaching it may vary at times. You know, today, and you probably noticed it, today we tend to emphasize when we're speaking the gospel, what do we emphasize? God's love and his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness. You know, phrases like, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Now, some of you... Remember that? That was the Campus Crusade message. That's how they evangelized. That's when they came across people, that's what they would say. You know, God loves you, and he has a wonderful plan for your life. And then, as it came along a little bit more, and, and for a long time, at least in our experience, uh, in a lot of Calvary chapels, it was, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. And then, along with that is, hey, Come as you are. You remember that song? Come just as you are. And so phrases like that were, were used as kind of the starting point in sharing the Lord with, with people and presenting the gospel. And you know what? Those things are all, every one of those I said is absolutely true. Those things are true. But did you know that for many, many years, that was not the emphasis in preaching the gospel? In the 17 and 1800s, a great deal of the gospel message was presented by people who were called fire and brimstone preachers. You've heard that term, right? Oh, they just preach fire and brimstone. I want you to read this, and I, and I got this, uh, and, and I know many of you have read this book. It's called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. This is from Wikipedia. This is awesome. It says, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God is a sermon written by the American Christian theologian Jonathan Edwards, preached to his own congregation in Northampton, Massachusetts, to profound effect. And again on July 18, 1741 in Enfield, Connecticut. The preaching of this sermon was the catalyst for the first great awakening. Like Edwards' other works, it combines vivid imagery of hell with observations of the world and citations of the scripture. It is Edwards' most famous written work. It is a fitting representation of his preaching style and is widely studied by Christians and historians, providing a glimpse into the theology of the first great awakening of 1730 to 1755. 
Now, where did Jonathan Edwards get the inspiration for that type or style of preaching? Well, I want you to take a sneak peek down to verses 9 through 11. And this is speaking of, the, of those who worship the beast and take his mark. This is what it says about him. He will be tormented with fire and brimstone. The smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night. So this was the emphasis during that time, and there was a great revival here in America during the time that that was being preached. So the question is, when and why did the emphasis on the gospel message change? Well, what happened was in the 20th century, and early in the 20th century, churches began to wane in attendance all over the country. So as often happens, people do research. And the research showed that people were not responding to the fire and brimstone message. And I remember even growing up, hearing from people all the time, I don't go to church because they church, they, you know, that they just teach fire and brimstone. I, I don't know any church that I've ever been to that every Sunday the guy comes up and says, fire and brimstone. But that's kind of the impression that was, that was left. But see, 20th century folks were way too sophisticated for that message. They were too sophisticated to believe in hell or to believe in Satan. And they would not accept that God would punish people in this way. So church attendance got smaller and smaller. So as I mentioned, the message at some point in time, and I believe probably in the late 60s, uh, the message began to emphasize God's love and his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness of sin. I think maybe the key verses that really helped propel this approach was Romans 2, 4, where it says, Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. And then, of course, 1 John 4, 8, the one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, this approach, obviously, if you follow church history, at least from the 1960s, it had good results. Many people came to the Lord and responded through this type of message and this type of teaching and preaching. And it's really still a popular approach today, isn't it? You still hear those phrases today. And, and the idea is that people are much more likely to respond to a message of God's love than a message of God's judgment. After all, God is love. But we do need to understand that there is a weakness to this approach. And I can say from experience of numbers of people who came to the Lord through that message never got deeper and have walked away from the Lord. Um, I think you know the statistics even of the Harvest Crusades or the old Billy Graham Crusades that if 10,000 people walked down to receive the Lord that if you followed through with them, about a thousand of them were, would continue to be walking with the Lord. True salvation. Now look, don't get me wrong, that's awesome. I mean, that's well worth it. But there's a weakness in this approach. Although it is the truth, it's not the whole truth. God is love, but that's just one of his many attributes. And the other attribute that we need to make sure people understand is that God is love, but God is holy. And because God is holy, he must judge sin. Now, let me ask you a question. How could we really understand that God is a gracious and loving and merciful God if we don't know or understand or believe that God will judge sin? 
Think about that. I mean, to really comprehend how much God loves us, then we have to understand how horrible our sin is, number one, and that we deserve God's judgment for our sin. I mean, if God wasn't going to judge our sin anyway, then where would the, where would the love be? The love is because we deserve that judgment. And as we have read here in Revelation, that judgment is real. And it's horrible. So, it's so important when we present the gospel to people that we present the whole gospel. I kind of laugh when people call the full gospel. That just, you know, when everyone says, are you a full gospel church? That means do you speak in tongues, by the way. That's code, code words for that. Nothing wrong with that, but I'm just saying that's, that's what they mean. And, and people say, so are you a full gospel church? Well, you know, the full gospel is not the gifts of the Spirit. And again, by the way, the books are coming in. They should be here this week, hopefully on the spiritual gifts, so you can read, you know, about spiritual gifts. We believe that all the gifts are available, including tongues for today. But that's not the full gospel. No, that's how the church is built up. Romans 5 gives us a great picture of the full gospel. Would you turn over to Romans 5, please? <clears throat> Romans 5, starting in verse 6. Romans 5, 6 says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. You see, you don't have to go into huge long explanations, but if you're sharing the gospel with someone, why not turn to this passage? Because it explains we're sinners. We deserve God's judgment. But God demonstrated his love. There's that message we all like. God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were even sinners, his son, Jesus Christ, came and died for us. Why? To save us from the wrath of God. And then when people go, what's the wrath of God like? Flip them over to Revelation. You're going to be an expert in it now. So, you know, when we tell people that they need to be saved, it's pretty important for them to understand to be saved from what? It doesn't mean anything without that. Well, I think you can see how important this is and why when we share the gospel, we want to share the full gospel with people. Yes, God is love. But why is God love? Because Jesus died to pay the price for our sin. Otherwise, we would have been like these people we're going to read about in Revelation. All right, verse 8 of Revelation 14. And another angel, a second one, followed saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. So again, this is a statement of what is soon going to take place. Again, since it's going to take place in God's mind, it's already happened. And as we've said before, that Babylon represents what? The system of this world. A system that's in rebellion against God. A system of false religion. A system that has corrupt politics, greed, immorality. This is Babylon. This is what it represents. And this system, as we see here, is destined to be judged by God once and for all. When we complain about this world system... We live in, let's be reminded, it will be judged once and for all. Verse 9, then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Notice the comparison there with the wine, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger. 
and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Verse 11, And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day or night. Those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. As you look in here, you can see, and I've said this before, that no one is going to take the mark of the beast unwittingly, unknowingly, or unwillingly. It's those who already are worshiping the beast that are going to take the mark. And that group will be made up of people who value the things of this world above anything else. That's why they're going to worship the beast, and that's why they're going to take the mark. And look, the things of this world are enticing, aren't they? Even for believers, especially for believers when they're doing the faith. Galatians 4, 3 says, So also we, while we were children, meaning children in the faith, were held in bondage under the elemental things of the world. When we first became Christians, it was hard to change a lot of our, well, speaking for myself, maybe it wasn't for you. I've seen people who make that, you know, really quick turnaround and everything in their life. However, I've seen a lot of those people years down the road go right back to the world. Have you seen that? No, usually it takes some time. And we're held under bondage to the elemental things of the world, to the way the world thinks and acts and behaves. But we have some great instructions concerning those things, and it's in 1 John 2.15. So flip over to 1 John, just a couple books back. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. We're going to start in verse 15. But we're going to read this and to help us understand the picture that's being presented here of Babylon and the world system, I'm going to just paraphrase a little. You'll probably notice it as we go through it. But 1 John 2.15. Do not love Babylon, nor the things in Babylon, if anyone loves Babylon, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in Babylon, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from Babylon. Babylon is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Does that help you understand the picture here? Yeah. Babylon is the seat of the world system going all the way back to the beginning. And that's why, of course, we studied Daniel as we were studying the beginning of Revelation. Now, we also see some other very important theological points in these three verses. Many of us have been taught that part of the torment of the lake of fire is that God is not there. <coughs> We, we, we say to people, you're going to be judged, and you know, God's not there. But we see in these three verses that that is not true. Look again at verse 10. Verse 10 clearly states that Jesus and the angels are present. Look, God is what? Omnipresent. He is everywhere at once. So he has to be there. David made this very clear in Psalm 139. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? That's a rhetorical question. <laughs> there is nowhere. That's what he's saying. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, which is the abode of the dead, behold, you are there. So, it's clear that God is there. So what does that mean for the person who is there? Well, what it means is that though God is present, you have no access to him. You can't call upon his name. You can't ask for help. If you remember back in, in the story of uh, Lazarus and the rich man, <clears throat> the rich man was crying out really for help and there was none to be there. You see, this is the wine of God's wrath. No access to God. Now, can you, and I want you to try to imagine, can you imagine sitting here today and knowing and believing that there is a God in heaven who created you, 
who made everything in the universe, who can do anything at any time, and you cannot cry out to him for help. You can't ask him all those things that you ask him every day to do for you, that he's not available for that. I mean, for me, and I've said this many times over my life as a Christian, I cannot imagine anything worse than to not be able to speak to my Heavenly Father, to not be able to cry out to him in my times of need. I can't imagine anything worse than that. I want you to notice the second point of theology here, that this torment is eternal. Now, there are those who believe, and it's become more popular in the last few years, they believe that the punishment is only temporary. That at some point, that punishment will stop, and you'll be just like a computer screen that goes blank. That your soul will just perish. This view, you may have heard of, it's called annihilationism. It's not a biblically supported view, as you can see right here. And I'm not really sure where this teaching began, how it originated, but what it is, it's another vain attempt by man to place his reasoning and value system on God rather than the other way around. These people would say, well, how is it fair for a person who sinned in this short-term life we have to them be punished eternally. In their minds, this isn't right. This isn't fair. So what they did with this idea was try to make God appear more fair to men and say, well, no, you know, the torment, the punishment, the penalty for your sin is only going to be temporary. Then you'll be annihilated and you, there's just nothing there, nothing left. And that way they figured, oh, okay, well, that sounds a little more fair. Look, God does not need any human to try and change what the Scripture clearly states in order to make him more appealing to people. And we don't have to ever try to do that. I think sometimes we do when we're talking with people. You know, we kind of water some things down rather than speak the whole truth because we want to make sure that we don't push them away. You're not going to push them away. They're already away. They're already dead in their sin. Okay? So we don't have to defend the truth of God in any way, shape, or form. We just need to tell them what God's truth is. Not up to us to defend it. Verse 11 says very clearly that the torment is forever and ever. Now, I looked that word up, and it means forever and ever. <laughs> The word in Greek is aeon. It means forever, an unbroken age, perpetuity of time, eternity. Could it be any more clear? No. It's completely clear. Forever and ever means forever and ever. And look, since God has made a way for anyone in the entire world who has ever been born and lived, to not have to go through this. He has made a way for that. You can never question God's fairness. He made the way. It's your choice. All right, verse 12. Here is the perseverance of the saints who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit so that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. So this is a contrast between those who are going to suffer the wrath of God as compared to those who follow Jesus and keep his commands. And it says about them that they're going to rest from their labor. Doesn't that sound good? It sounded really good the other day when I spent three hours shoveling snow. I wanted to rest from my labor. To rest from their labor and their good deeds are going to follow them. This speaks, of course, of our heavenly rewards. And I know we don't like to talk about that. You know, we, we, we like to say, well, I just do it because I love Jesus. I don't care about the reward. But you know what? There's no shame in caring about the reward. It's, we're, we're told we're going to receive these oftentimes. And Paul tells us we should work for those rewards. It's a great thing. 
Verse 14, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud. And sitting on the cloud was one like a son of man, having a golden crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. And another angel came out of the temple, crying out with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Put your sickle, put in your sickle and reap, for the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth is ripe. Then he who sat on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was reaped. Now I believe that verse 14 here is, is speaking of Jesus here. But some believe it to be an angel because they struggle with the fact that if it's Jesus, he's responding to what an angel says. Like, Jesus doesn't take commands from angels. And uh, no, he doesn't take commands from angels. But look, if we look at the description, it's the same description that we've seen over and over. Like a son of man wearing a golden crown. This crown, by the way, is the victor's wreath. It's not the, the, the other crown, the diadem that we've mentioned before. It's, it's the victor's wreath. It's describing one who is victorious. We don't ever see angels described this way. And look, in the rest of these passages, they just kept saying, another angel, another angel, second angel, third angel. I mean, why would they change and not call this another angel? I think it's clear that this is Christ here. And I have no problem with him responding to uh, the statement of the angel because this was written ahead of time. Jesus knew he was going to do it. Maybe God spoke to the angel, said, okay, tell my son this is the time, <laughs> even though he knew it. I don't have a problem with that. Some people do. The sickle that we see here, it's called a drepanon. <laughs> and the reason it's important, because there's two different types of sickles that we'll see in here, uh, not in this chapter, but the drepanon is the large, um, it's actually uh, a gathering hook. So it's a large sickle, a big one. They, they have another sickle that's a small one, kind of like, you know, you cut the grapes off the vine individually. But this is the large one. It's, it's for harvesting. And, of course, this is what happens here. And so what this is telling us is that this is the time for the final harvest of the wicked. This was all foretold back in Matthew chapter 13, if you want to write that down. And you can read what it says about it. But in those parables that we receive in Matthew 13... We learn that God would, in the end times, separate the wheat from the tares. You remember that story? What's that all about? Well, what it's all about is that, guess what? Uh, Christians and non-Christians grow up together, and sometimes you can't tell them apart. That's what it says. But the point of it was is that we now don't need to worry about it. You know how sometimes you're going, I'm not sure if that person's really saved. Well, just pray for them. You don't need to worry about that. Because this is God's job. At the end, I guarantee you, if they're a terror, they're not going in. Let's just be concerned with us and make sure we're the wheat. Amen? Amen. <laughs> now, this is interesting. The word for ripe here is zeraino in the Greek. It means to become dry or to be withered. In other words, what it's really saying is this harvest is not only ripe, it's kind of overripe to the point that it's actually dead. Well, isn't that a great picture? I think it implies that these people are spiritually dead and there is no more time for them to repent. They're already spiritually dead. Now, this time, of course, that we're getting into here is speaking of what we're going to be reading later. It's the time of what we call the Battle of Armageddon. It's not really a battle. A battle implies that two sides might have, either side might have a chance to win, right? <laughs> That's not what kind of battle it is, as we're going to see. But this battle has been predicted in, in detail by the prophet Joel. It's in Joel 3, starting in verse 12. Joel said, Let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, tread. For the wine press is full, the vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon grow dark, and the stars lose their brightness. So this is all speaking 
of what's going to happen at that time of Armageddon just before or as the Lord returns to the earth. Verse 17, And another angel, again, another angel, came out of the temple which is in heaven and also had a sharp sickle. Verse 18, And then another angel, the one who has power over fire, came out of the altar. What does that mean, has power over fire? It means it's, it's representing the fire on the altar. Remember we talked about that before. It's the prayers of the saints being burned and going up as incense to the Lord. And he called with a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle saying, put in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth because her grapes are ripe. So the angel swung his sickle to the earth and gathered the clusters from the vine of the earth and threw them into the great wine press, we just read about in Joel, in the great wine press of the wrath of God. Verse 20, and the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood came out from the wine press up to the horse's bridles for a distance of 200 miles. Now, this is a preview of the bloodbath that's going to take place at Armageddon, where the beast and all the armies of the world that are joining him gather to make war against Jesus. Not a smart move. Now this imagery goes all the way back to the Old Testament picture of Israel being God's vineyard, planted by God to bear fruit, meaning bringing others to God, representing God. That was the fruit that they were to bear. You can read in Isaiah 5 too, and, and you might want to go back and read that whole, uh, it's like an Old Testament parable. It's one of my favorite stories in, in the Old Testament, where it says, he, meaning God, who is the vine dresser, dug it all around, removed its stones, and planted it with the choicest vine. And he built a tower, that's a watchtower, in the middle of it, and also hewed out a wine vat in it. And this is the key. Then he expected it, this vineyard, who represents Israel, he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. In other words, God had done everything for Israel for it to be a successful vineyard, to bear the fruit that he desired it. He built the watchtower. He did everything in preparation for this vineyard of Israel to be successful, but it wasn't. Jesus in Matthew 21, 33 through 46, showed how Israel had totally failed in its calling. But then Jesus himself became the vine for us. Turn over to John chapter 15. You guys are going, we're turning a lot today. Yeah, I love it. John chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Jesus said, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. This is Jesus speaking to the disciples and followers that were with him. He says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And that's speaking of nothing spiritually and spiritual fruit. Verse 6, if anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away as a branch and dries up. And they gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. What we see here and comparing it to what we're reading in Revelation is that those who have not chosen to abide in the true vine, Jesus, are part of the vineyard of the world. And that vineyard is going to get harvested and it's going to get thrown into the wine press. 
to be trampled on. Do you know that this is the inspiration for the Battle Hymn of the Republic? That was the inspiration for that song that we sing. The result that we see that's going to happen in that Battle of Armageddon is horrible bloodshed. Now, whether it's literally speaking of 200 miles up to the horse's bridle, I don't know. We don't know. But we do know, at least it's speaking of how bad it's going to be. It's giving us a, an image of that. Now, today's message is that through God's grace, we have the opportunity to abide, to live in the true vine. We have that opportunity. So the question for us today as we finish up this particular chapter is, are we living in him today? Are we abiding in Jesus today? And, and when I say that, I don't just mean have you accepted him as your savior. I, I hope that you all have, and I hope all of you watching on Facebook, I hope that you have. But it goes deeper than that when we talk about abiding in Christ. Abiding means living. And so you can think of it this way. Do you go to Jesus every day? When you go to your home, you go to your home every day pretty much, right? Not, not every day, but you might be on vacation, but you go home. You abide in your home. And that's what Jesus is speaking about here. Do you spend time with him every single day of your life? Is he the highest priority in your life? That's what it means to abide in him. And here's the thing. You may ask yourself, I'm not, I'm not really sure. How, how do I know? Well, you know because you're going to see fruit in your life. What is that fruit? Now, oftentimes people say, well, the only fruit is that you bring others to Christ. No, that's, that's not true. That's, that's a demonstration of fruit for sure. But Galatians 5, 22 and 23 tell us what the fruit is. If you're abiding in Christ, if you make your home in him, if you come home to him every single day, this, these are things you're going to see in your life. You're going to see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the things you're going to see in your life. These are the things that other people are going to look at you and go, that, that person's different. I mean, if you look at a person that demonstrates all of those fruits, wouldn't you look at them and go, boy, they're not like the world. And of course, that's what opens up the opportunities to bear the fruit of evangelization. People will want to know, why are you like this? Why do you not go ballistic when you see all these things happening in the world? Why do you not pay back evil for evil, but good for evil? Why do you do that? That's what happens when we are living in Christ, when we're abiding in him, spending time with him every day and asking the Holy Spirit to guide our life each day. Galatians 5.25, after showing us all the fruit of the Spirit, says very simply, if we live by the Spirit, let us also walk by the Spirit. You see, we can't manufacture any of this. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit living inside us that we can demonstrate those qualities. Now look, I will say, and of course I think you know why we study Daniel and why we're studying Revelation. I firmly believe that we are very, very, very close to the rapture. Amen. I do. I think the signs of the season, which is what we're supposed to read because we don't know the day or the hour, but we're supposed to look at the signs. I look around, I, you know, I see signs everywhere a sign. Remember that old song? Sign, sign, everywhere a sign. That's what I see everywhere I look. Every morning or evening when I am on my iPad reading the news, it's a sign to me. But look, even if we're not that close, even if it's going to take longer than we anticipated. We're to abide in Jesus, and I, and I like what it tells us in Galatians 6.10. And I think this is our instructions for living in the world today. So then, while we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, and especially those who are of the household of faith. 
Amen? Amen. 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 And Maranatha. Amen. Let's pray. <laughs> Heavenly Father, again, thank you for this magnificent chapter of your word. So instructive, Lord. God, how can we thank you for showing us ahead of time what's going to happen? You know, I think of the millions of the people who get up and read astrology charts. They go to mediums. They do all of these things because they want to know the future. You have shown us the future. And Lord, because of that knowledge, it should help us in how we deal with life today. In your final instruction here in Galatians 6, Lord, this is what we want to be. We want to do good to all people. We don't want to repay evil with evil, but evil with good. Lord, we want to not be so angry that we let ourselves sin. Lord, we do want to stand up for righteousness, but we want to do it in a loving way that draws people to you rather than pushes them away. So God, help us to be those kind of people. Lord, I want to thank you for each one that's here this morning. Lord, they may not know it, but even their very presence here is such an encouragement to those of us who began this church. And Lord, we know that you have a plan for us and we want to follow through on whatever your plan is. So speak to all of our hearts as how you want us to continue on and, and maybe even to, you know, what else we may be doing in terms of ministry, Lord, in terms of, uh, you know, helping people in our community, showing the love of Christ. But Lord, bless each one that's here this morning in a very special way. Lord, we're so thankful that we can approach you. We can come boldly before your throne of grace, that we have access to you, Lord. We can't imagine what it would be if we didn't. So Lord, bless each one this morning. As they go their way this week, would you help them to be filled with your Holy Spirit and to accomplish the purposes of which you've called them to this week. And God bless this church. Help us to be the kind of church that you want us to be, Lord. We don't care about anything else. We don't care about methods. We don't care about numbers. We only want to be the church you want us to be, and we let you take care of all the rest, Lord. We thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand for a closing song? Pray with you. So God bless you guys and have a wonderful week. 
And same to you on Facebook. God bless you guys. We'll see you on Wednesday night.